Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Uh, I'd like to uh, start by introducing to you uh, uh, Dr. Andy Mason. Uh, he is the longest continuous serving member of an intermediate, sorry, an immediate care scheme in the UK. Suffolk Accident Rescue Services, Suffolk's immediate care scheme, and he volunteered for SARS on the 1st of April and joined on the 1st of April 1974. Um, and so for over 40 years, he's been a member of SARS before his retirement in November last year. During his many years of voluntary service, he helped over 2,000 critically ill or injured patients, saving lives in the process. Um, and if any of you have seen the uh, front page of the Ipswich Star, you'll know exactly how the, how the system works. He was also Senior Medical Officer at Newmarket Races for many years. Again, he retired last year. He's trained hundreds of local emergency personnel, paramedics and St John's to name but a few. And he was the world pioneer in the use of the larynx laryngeal mask airway, uh, I knew I was going to have trouble with that, um, for serious trauma and cardiac arrest in post-hospital, sorry, pre-hospital care. Um, this is now a standard item on all UK frontline ambulances. Finally, he was one of the first clinicians in the UK to pioneer the use of the portable defibrillator. An, an item of life-saving equipment which you can now find in many villages and towns around our, country, our county. And I know many of us have, have helped uh, with the um, installation of defibrillators in our local villages and towns through our locality budgets. He's now Honorary President of SARS and uh, lives in, in one of the villages that I represent and has been a long-standing friend of mine. So welcome, Dr. Mason. Uh, Madam Chairman, uh, Councillors, thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction and for this opportunity to tell you a little about, bit about the Accident Rescue Service. Some of you will know about us, but others perhaps uh, will be less familiar. So uh, this is a really excellent opportunity uh, for me to, uh, to fill in some blanks. Um, as, um, as your chairman said, I've actually responded for over 40 years as a frontline physician uh, in immediate care, but now they have made me president, and my job now is to actually uh, try and promote the service and hopefully to raise money so that a new generation of responders, uh, we can put those in place. So what is uh, Act the Suffolk Accident Rescue Service? Well, it's a medical charity and it provides uh, specialist immediate care for patients at uh, pre-hospital emergencies in Suffolk and the surrounding area. We've undertaken over 16,000 calls since we were set up in 1972, which is an average of over one call for every day of every one of those 43 years that we've been in existence. We have had 27 volunteers who have responded for us in the last year, doctors, critical care paramedics, and other specialist immediate care practitioners. Um, all calls that we do are done without any charge to the patient, to the ambulance service, or indeed to the taxpayer, because we pay no fees to any of our responders. Um, we are one of 31 similar schemes in the United Kingdom, all set up as charities, um, and under the umbrella organisation called BASICS, the British Association for Immediate Care, the headquarters of which happens to be here in Ipswich. So Suffolk really is the mecca of immediate care in the United Kingdom. And uh, it's important to say we receive absolutely no government funding for the work that we do. SARS relies entirely upon voluntary donations to continue its vital work. So what is immediate care? It's the provision of skilled medical aid at the scene of a trauma incident or life-threatening medical emergency or during transportation to hospital. 
Um, it was uh, first um, introduced in 1967 by the late Dr Ken Easton, who set up a scheme in North Yorkshire. He uh, negotiated with government for several years to try and get central government to fund such a scheme, but in the end he set up a charity to do that, and that has been the template for all immediate care schemes throughout the United Kingdom. Um, Rentham GP, uh, Suffolk GP, the late Dr. Graham Bracewell, he uh, started uh, SARS uh, going and we uh, started our um, responding to calls from what was then the Suffolk Ambulance Service on the 1st of May 1972. So why was SARS set up? Well, there were no paramedics in East Anglia until the late 1980s, so you may be aware of that. Uh, prior to that, the picture on the left of the screen, bottom, shows a typical county ambulance, um, which um, typically would have two um, uh, St John uh, crew who simply had a public first aid certificate. So there was no um, advanced medical treatment being offered at that time and that's why there's a little clipping from the East Anglia Daily Times just telling about uh, uh, the fact that we were going to have an accident rescue service and that's dated 1971. Uh, why is SARS, SARS still needed? Well, you're probably aware we've got a population of about three quarters of a million. Uh, in terms of area, um, Suffolk is um, eighth out of 48 um, in, in terms of size, yet in terms of population density, uh, 38th out of 48. So we're a big county, uh, very rural, uh, long distances between our hospitals, and therefore we need specialist medics out there uh, to provide life-saving uh, care for people before they reach hospital. Um, this is our network of, um, of uh, solo responders. We also have responders who respond on our uh, rapid response vehicle, but you can see they're scattered round and about throughout Suffolk, um, and that's our team response vehicle. We have one of those. Um, I've put red, bracket, uh, red box around those of our members who also work on the air ambulance, which you probably know about the air ambulance. When they're working for the air ambulance, they will be paid uh, the shifts for working for, for the air ambulance. When they work for us, they give their time without any charge at all. Um, this shows um, the sort of uh, distance we can travel under red lights in five minutes, the crucial five minutes of a heart stops. But if we're going to, say, a trapped patient in a road traffic collision, um, 20 minutes under uh, blue lights, and you can see we can cover with our network of uh, specialists the entire um, uh, county of Suffolk. Here is a map which shows uh, the stars show uh, the SARS incidents which were attended in 2014, the green stars uh, between one and three calls right down to the red star which is um, up to 20 calls I think there. Um, and you can see we cover quite a large area there from um, uh, Fakenham in the north um, down to South End um, and um, uh, from Great Yarmouth uh, down to Harlow. So if I now put in the outline of Suffolk, you'll see the majority of our calls are done within the county. And if you squint your eyes, you can probably see the line of the A14, which mm -hmm. comes down from Newmarket through Bury um, and through Ipswich to Felixstowe. Um, um, what happens if you dial 999? Well, you get uh, to an ambulance uh, service call taker. This person will have no medical training, uh, but um, an expert in, in, uh, in extracting the information over a telephone and using the algorithm on the computer to actually direct the primary uh, ambulance response uh, to the scene. Um, and the sources, resources that may be dispatched are obviously a double-staffed ambulance uh, or a rapid response vehicle with a sim single paramedic on. But nowadays we have a network of uh, community first responders. In fact, there may be a community first responder amongst us here. People, members of the public who volunteer, carry a defibrillator, oxygen, and go out typically to people with chest pain or having heart attacks to start off the treatment before the professionals arrive. Uh, very important. 
Um, we've got three uh, centres which take 999 calls in the east of England ambulance service area. There is one, it's called a HEOC, um, a Health and Emergency Operations Centre at Norwich, and that takes the calls from Cambridgeshire, Suffolk and Norfolk. Um, there's one over in Bedfordshire and another in Chelmsford. But, if you like, looking over the shoulder of that call taker who has no medical training, there will be a skilled and experienced critical care paramedic who works on the air ambulance, so knows exactly the sort of um, uh, requirements uh, in any particular emergency. They'll be monitoring all the screens from the three centres to direct the nearest um, advanced resource to the scene. And these are the sort of things they're looking for. Uh, anything in red, that gets an immediate response. That includes person hit by train, a young paediatric cardiac arrest, things like that. But there's some pretty nasty things in the blue section. Um, the critical care paramedic will get back to the caller and ask key questions. And if it appears that, a, that an advanced resource is required over and above the standard double-stuffed ambulance or the rapid response vehicle, paramedic vehicle, they will then dispatch... Um, possibly one of the air ambulances, and we have three charities in the region, the East Anglian Air Ambulance with two helicopters, one based at Norwich, another at Cambridge, the Essex and Hearts Air Ambulance with the Essex one being at uh, Earls Cone um, and the Hertfordshire Air Ambulance at North Weald, and then right over in the west of the area is the Magpass Ambulance. But, of course, there's only one ambulance, actually, air ambulance, that actually works uh, during the hours of darkness, and that's the Cambridge one, uh, which uh, Prince William is now flying on, as I'm sure you've heard. Um, but that actually goes to bed at 1 o'clock in the morning. So the, during the wee small hours of the morning, the only advanced resource, and the only advanced resource actually s based here in Suffolk, is the Suffolk Accident Rescue Service. That's a breakdown of our typical call-outs, 32% road traffic collisions, but we do a lot of cardiac arrests now, 18% medical, 13% falls. Unfortunately, 2% of our work is uh, stabbings. seem to be very popular nowadays. Um, what, what can a, a doctor do, um, or one of our specialists do? Well, help to save, save life, but possibly, almost as important, help to prevent permanent disability. Um, if you keep somebody out of a wheelchair for the rest of their, their, your, their life, then that's a really, really important thing. We carry really powerful painkillers, so powerful that uh, they can't be distributed to the paramedics on the frontline ambulances. We can also undertake sedation and anaesthesia. Anaesthesia is not difficult to send people uh, off to sleep. Uh, I could teach you to do that. The, the clever thing is actually get them wake up again afterwards. <laughs> Um, advanced airway skills, um, we can uh, do tracheostomies, cut into the airway if necessary to secure the airway. We have an enhanced range of equipment and drugs which are not present on the frontline ambulances. We can do advanced surgical procedures. If somebody gets stabbed in the heart, the only way you will save their life is to actually open their chest from one armpit to the other and open their chest like a clamshell. It's called a clamshell thoracotomy, and then like the little Dutch boy, you can put your finger in the hole. But that is a very dramatic thing to do, and of course, only specialists like us actually are trained uh, to do that. We can triage patients. That means sort out who is the most seriously ill. It may sound easy, but it is really difficult and requires experience. Uh, the person who's making all the noise is at least getting air up and down their trachea. It's the person who's actually quiet and going grey is the one who requires urgent treatment. We can arrive before other medical resources, and 15% of the time, SAR specialists are actually at the scene first. Um, and we can undertake major incident medical command duties, say if there were a, a train crash with a lot of, um, a lot of um, um, uh, people injured. Uh, and we frequently do this, travel in the ambulance with the patient to hospital to help to keep people alive. As I've said before, we receive absolutely no statutory 
uh, funding. It's all voluntary. We are sort of living beyond our means a little bit in that over the last three years our average income has been 62,000, our expenditure 68,000. We don't have a huge reserve. But we do have a fundraising target. Uh, we've got a new fundraising manager who's done wonderful things, and uh, we've set uh, the target for 115,000 for the coming year. Um, you probably read that the East Anglian Air Ambulance and the Essex and Hearts got a £1.7 million grant from the LIBOR Fund, which will. Uh, that uh, £1.67 million grant would actually keep us going for all our needs b between 10 and 15 years. Um, whereas each of the air ambulances require about five or six million pounds, possibly a little bit more, to actually keep it going annually. Um, we're fundraising for new responders. There are three of our new ones. We have some major items of equipment. A monitoring um, device at the bottom would cost up to £12,000. This is a device that actually the patient sort of goes through this, um, and that's a plunger that comes down and actually does uh, heart uh, cardiac compression for us to keep a patient alive. Um, we have a team response vehicle. It's um, 2008 Subaru Forester, which was kindly bought for us by uh, the Guineas Ball at Newmarket. Um, our ambition would be, we're not fundraising for this at the moment, our ambition would be to get a new one. We looked at this, um, very economical, 500 miles to the gallon, but um, a little bit slow. This one was uh, much faster, but no, no, no room for our equipment or our crew. Um, so something that, like this would be absolutely wonderful. So um, uh, we would, would need uh, help to make this possible. See my little, there we are. Wouldn't this look good? Supported by Suffolk County Council. <laughs> I'm sure the voters in Suffolk would love to see this going around and realising that you're doing a really valuable job as councillors. Um, but saving life involves teamwork. It's not just us. There are the Coast Guard, the police, the uh, ambulance, the people at the hospital, the fire service. Um, and you can see probably the air ambulance up in the air uh, there as well. Uh, this is me. Um, uh, I'm just uh, sedating a patient prior to um, putting an airway in there. Uh, we're just I'm going to take him to Adam Brooks. That's actually a seeking helicopter from Wattisham. Um, but um, he was dying at the scene, and uh, he's now become a good friend. Uh, he's just had his golden wedding, um, and he's uh, had one great-granddaughter, and there's another one on the way. So that was uh, 15 years ago that I saved his life. So um, on the front of the Ipswich Star, you will see a heartwarming story about one of our latest ones, you saved my life five times. That wasn't me, that was our team on our team response vehicle. Um, a 45-year-old lady who had five heart attacks and was taken down to Basildon to have a special heart operation done. Um, and this was world-class care that this person received. I've nearly, yeah. I'm, um, there's another uh, example. So maximum of our charity is we need your help we hope that you never need ours. So, thank you very much indeed, uh, Chairman. So, if you have any questions, uh, obviously I can't answer them now, but uh, I'm available by email, and um, I just say thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I'm sure you can see the great work that SARS does, and, and uh, it's not, um, it's, it's not uh, obviously government-sponsored or anything, so that's why I, I chose it as one of the charities uh, that I'm going to support this year. 
Um, so, welcome to everybody, uh, to councillors, officers and members of the public. Um, if you could turn your phones uh, to silent or off. Uh, I, um, I actually fell foul in our group meeting this morning by having my phone go off. So I have to pay £10 to my own charity. Uh, so, <laughs> so just in case um, you, you were... Uh, wondering about that. Uh, it's uh, a fine of £10 if it goes off in the meeting. All right, that's as long as we understand. Um, a reminder that an audio recording is being made of the meeting and will be published on the, on the, uh, the minutes will be published on the website. Um, it is a warm day, so gentlemen, if you'd like to remove your jackets if you haven't already done so. Um, there's plenty of water around, but if you need any more, then please just get some. Uh, the air conditioning has been on all, uh, well, for about 24 hours now. So they have tried to keep the council chamber as cool as possible. But with so much hot air, hot air and uh, warm bodies, I'm sure that it's uh, struggling. Uh, but just uh, bear with it. Um, the uh, chairman's announcements... Um, I will try and, uh, try and keep these as, as brief as possible, um, but it's important to give respect to uh, some of the items on here. Um, we have, I have uh, to announce, uh, sadly, the death of a former Chief Constable of Suffolk. Stuart Whiteley, CBE, C, uh, QPM, former Chief Constable of Suffolk, died peacefully in Framlingham on June the 5th, 2015, aged 87. He had a distinguished policing career across different constabularies. His contribution to policing was recognised in 1967 when he was awarded the Queen's Policing Medal for Distinguished Service. Stuart led the Suffolk Constabulary for 18 years from 1976 and was known for setting high standards and his attention to detail which probably um, begs the question as to, oh, I wonder what that was all about. In 1982, he was made a CBE for his contribution to the police service. During his service in Suffolk, Stuart was also actively involved in the local community and parish councils and the Woodbridge Excelsior Brass Band. After his retirement, Mr Whiteley was a member of the Home Office Police Disciplinary Appeals Panel and in 1990 he was appointed High Steward of Ipswich, a position he held until 2007. Our thoughts are with his son and his family. Very sadly, we have, uh, I have to announce uh, with deep regret uh, a death in service. Um, I have to inform you of the tragic and sudden death of Mrs. Leslie Farrow, head teacher of Woodhall Primary, Community Primary School, Sudbury. Leslie died after falling from a horse at the weekend. Leslie had been he head teacher at Woodhall Primary School since September 2014 and had previously been head teacher at All Saints Middle School in Sudbury and Clements Primary School in Haverhill. She was highly regarded as an inspirational and very talented head teacher who loved her role and was dedicated to the school. Our thoughts are with her family and with and her fellow teachers, the children at her school and previous schools, parents and governors of Woodhall Community Primary School. Would councillors please join me in standing and marking a few moments' silence as a mark of our respect. Thank you very much.
now for some happier news. Uh, staff accolades. I would like to mention some accolades to staff, such as the achievement of Hannah Hodder, uh, a practice lead in the Moving into Adulthood team based in Adults and Community Services. Uh, she was awarded Tutor of the Year, as referred to in Councillor Hopfensberger's um, Cabinet Member's report. We've also had some success in the Municipal Journal Awards. In June, Suffolk County Council was a finalist at the MJ Awards in the Innovation in Procurement category. The Council received an accolade of highly commended from the judges for the way that the MIGO service was procured. The innovation was to use a procurement process involving working together with bidders through rounds of meetings to shape the MIGO service. The process is known as competitive dialogue and is the first in the country to use this approach to procure a service of this kind. Congratulations to Judith Mobbs, Kevin Roger, Katrina Gardner and Brian Foster. Would Kevin, Brian and Katrina, who I believe are in the audience, uh, like to stand, please, so we can make our... Well done. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a personal award from the National Association of, for Areas of Outstanding National Beauty. Because Catherine Potts, formerly Catherine Blake, uh, received an award from the National Association for Areas of Outstanding Natural Beauty, recognising 20 years' service to the AONB movement. Catherine started with the Dedham Vale AONB in 1993 as an assistant project officer, brackets, access and recreation, close brackets, where she quickly developed a passion for sharing the delights of the AONB and encouraging others to get out into the countryside. Catherine's achievements include working with local ramblers. She helped to develop the Stour Valley Path, a 63-mile route through the area. Catherine developed and got partner endorsement of the AONB's first formal management plan, creating a different style of management plan, which included a plan for a project area beyond the AONB, uh, beyond the AOMB boundary and engage further local authority partners, establishing a vis visitor management group for Flatford, the visitor hotspot in the Dedham Vale AOMB, as I'm sure we all know, en engaging individuals, organisations and businesses with an interest in the area with sometimes different priorities, bringing authority, sense and direction to enable people to work well together to achieve common aims of a sustainable tourism. And finally, helping to organise the National Association of AONB conference facilities, sorry, conference field trips to the Dead and Vale... Oh, somebody's got a message. Um, Dead and Vale in 2001 and the National Landscapes for Life conference in Ipswich in 2013. Is Catherine here? Yes, she is. Yeah, well done, Catherine. Well done. My final announcement gives me a particular um, pleasure. Um, it's long service recognition. It's my great pleasure to inform the Council that in June this year, Valerie Hill, MVO, has completed over 40 years in local government service in Suffolk. Um, actually, somebody did say to me that if I managed to keep this a secret from Valerie all this time, then I was, I was uh, doing a grand job, because there's nothing in this Council that's secret from Valerie. <laughs> Um, I want to give you a flavour of just how valuable her support has been to the council and to Suffolk people. Valerie started her career in local government at Suffolk Coastal District Council in the planning department in 1975 and joined the Suffolk County Council in June 1978. In January 1984, a recommendation was made by the Chief Executive to the Chairman to recognise her work over a three-month period where due to a long-running vacancy, Valerie single-handed provided a full secretarial service not only to the Chief Executive and County Solicitor, uh, but also on numerous occasions to the Lord Lieutenant 
of the county and the chairman of the county council. That's the note that is in her uh, records. In June 1992, Valerie was recommended for an award by the chief executive in recognition for a particularly demanding year where she undertook her full duties as well as secretarial duties for the clerk of the county council and chairman of the policy committee and organising and taking full responsibility for arranging social functions, receptions, dinner, etc., for the chairman. In November 2002, Valerie officially took on the dual role of assistant to the lieutenancy for Suffolk and also for the chairman of the council. Each chairman and vice chairman has been suitably inducted, handheld, briefed, drilled, blinged, (laughs) and photographed and supported to enable them to be outstanding ambassadors for the council. Uh, All the past chairmen of the council have, since Valerie has been supporting the role, been given a personal record of their year in office with photos and newspaper articles which Val has taken a lovely personal touch which illustrates how thoughtful Valerie is in supporting others. At Council in July 2007, the then Chairman, Councillor Bill Sadler, proudly announced that Valerie Hill had been appointed by the Queen to the Royal Victorian Order for her work as the Assistant to the Clerk of the Lieutenancy of Suffolk, work which Val had been involved with for nearly 30 years. At the time, she was quoted in the press as saying that she was very pleased and privileged to have been awarded the honour, especially as it is one that comes directly from the Queen. Val went on to say that it was a job she loved where she had contact with so many people. Now, I actually phoned a couple of uh, chairmen, past chairmen, and I think one of them almost let the cat out of the bag by sending her a card. Oh, you just can't trust these people. Um, but one of them, when I phoned up, Charles Michel, he said he, she knows everyone from the palace to the car park. And I think uh, Dr Mason will verify that because he managed to get into the car park where probably nobody else can. Um, <laughs> Um, I know she feels the same about her job nearly a decade on, but one of the aspects of the, jo- of the work that uh, Valerie particularly enjoys is when she can make the time, is to visit schools and to talk to young children about the Queen, her royal household and royal visits, and she enjoys answering the children's questions. Having had two royal visits over the last um, month, um, I can... Um, personally testify to the amount of work and detail that goes into them. They are planned to the very, almost to the second, um, and Valerie puts in probably two, uh, two or three, maybe even four or five days into preparing for one of those. It involves uh, meeting with special branch, all sorts of other activities, um, going up to the palace and sorting things out. So it's... It, The way that they are run is a testament to her fantastic uh, ability. Um, Those of you who've seen uh, Val at work are likely to be aware that she keeps records um, of the huge number of events that she has been involved in planning and organising. And actually, you can see the evidence around her desk. Um, It's it's quite something. Um, These records provide a a rich archive of Suffolk history, and in time I hope that maybe she'll write her memoirs, because there are some funny stories out there. Um, One, she told me that when I first came, uh, because we were talking about a venue for the chairman's reception next year, and I said, oh, what about Hawley Park? And she said, oh, yes. She said, I remember a councillor falling into a bush there. (laughs) And then there's the other occasion of a, of a mayor who uh, sat on a, on a wet seat and then had to go commando for the rest of the meeting. We won't go there. I'm not telling you who it was. Um, Val has encyclopedic knowledge of etiquette and protocol and years of, exp- of organising complex visits and events. Um, and she has many, many anecdotes that make sure that all of these things run very well. She continues to have energy and enthusiasm for her job and loves Suffolk as a place to live and work. Um, I did speak to Charles Michel. Um, He said, she's better than Google. At least, uh, she said, he said, she has encyclopedic knowledge and you know whatever answer she gives, she was going to be right. So there you go. 
Um, her colleagues in the, in the council and other authorities highly regard her, and she's regarded as the go-to person uh, for advice and guidance on royal and civic management and correspondence. The hundreds and hundreds of successful engagements run smoothly and even as has happened on one occasion when the Royal Helicopter landed in the wrong end of the field, Val ensured that the dignitaries relocated post-haste to form the reception line-up. So even when it goes wrong, it goes right when Val's in charge. Please join me. Oh, yes, I was going to say... Uh, that last year when I was vice chairman, I did threaten to throw myself at Prince Harry, and she said, please don't do that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to be seen rugby tackling the vice chairman of the county council. <laughs> We're all frightened of Valerie, and we all highly respect her, so please join me in thanking Valerie for her 40 years' service to Suffolk and the thousands of people whose lives have been enriched by the work Val does on our behalf and their behalf. I managed to surprise her. <laughs> right. Item number, official item number two. Uh, apologies for item. I've received apologies from, for absence from councillors Peter Belfield, Michael Bond, Peter Byatt, Tim Marks and Gary Green. Do we have any other apologies for absence? David. Yes, sir, Richard Kemp. Thank you very much. We move on to agenda item three, declaration of interest and dispensation. Do any councillors have any interest to declare other than those displayed on screen? Anything, anybody else? No? Okay, we'll move on to agenda item four minutes of the previous meeting. Um, there is an amendment to be made. Councillor Hudson's name appears twice. <laughs> um, he's listed as chairman and then he's in the list of attendees of, of councillors. So um, we've, we'll amend that and we'll also add Councillor David Nettleton, uh, whose name had been omitted. There is an, uh, uh, an amendment in minute number 11, the reference to Councillor Hopfensberger as cap cabinet member to become Becky Hopfensberger, um, as I believe that's her preferred option. Thank you. With these, with these changes, is it the wish of members that I sign these as a correct record? Thank you very much. I'll sign them at the end of the meeting. We now come on to uh, public questions. Uh, there have been four questions received from the public. The questions and answers will, re will be recorded as part of the minutes of this meeting. Each of the people asking a question has received a written response, response sorry, in advance of the meeting. Uh, can we have, first of all, uh, Adam Robertson, who has a question for James Finch regarding Lowestoft's third crossing. Welcome to today's council meeting. Uh, Suffolk County Council, along with Peter Aldos MP, announced on the 4th of June a steering group for Laustos Fair Crossing. Is this basically the continuation of the steering group formed in 2013 to look at moving Laustos forward? I ask this because there was not a cross-representation of Laustos population on that steering group, just politicians and business people. Will Suffolk County Council for a cross reputation for a cross representation of Lowestoft's politicians, not just politicians and business people suited to the ruling party. Thank you. Um, Councillor Finch. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr Robertson, for giving me your question. 
Through the tenacious work of the MP for Waveney, Peter Aldous, I'm convinced now that Lowestoft and Suffolk are now closer to a third crossing of Lake Lothing than they ever have been before. 2014 and the first half of 2015 has seen a great deal of work through the members of the Lowestoft Transport Infrastructure Prospectus, including detailed stakeholder in public engagement to support uh, Peter Aldous in reaching the current position. Now, in order to take this work forward and to deliver on the challenging ambition, a task and finish steering group has been formed under his chairmanship to make an overview of the feasibility study into a third crossing being funded by the government. This study is subject to very tight timescales by the Department for Transport and the steering group brings together representatives of elected bodies, then being Waveney District Council, Suffolk County Council, together with the re-elected Member of Parliament to ensure that this work stays on track. Now, that steering group includes key stakeholders in Lowestoft. The Port Authority, Highways England, Network Rail and the local business community and will be continue to be guided by the stakeholder and public consultation and engagement carried out to date. Mr Robertson, do you have a supplementary question? Yeah, I thank Councillor Finch for, for his answer. I just, for the record, just want to note that I've done a, a, a typo. I meant, will Suffolk County Council call for a cross-representation of Lowestoft's populations, not politicians, as the question I asked stated? However, there is an important point in relation in calling for a cross-representation. Sorry, do you have a question? Yes. Or, yes. There is an important point in relation in calling for a cross-representation of Lowestoft's politicians to be on the steering group for a fair crossing. The leader of the council has called for greater, great, for greater localism and devolution. He has even mentioned it in his report to the council today. Therefore, with this spirit in, of localism and devolution in mind, will Suffolk County Council call for the leader of the opposition on Waveney District Council and the councillor Bill Manford, leader of the UKIP group, to be part of the steering group? This is because there is a democratic deficit in relation to Suffolk County Council and Waverley District, District Council in relation to Conservative representation from Lowestoft. The Conserv I, think that's, I think you're making a statement now. Uh, we'll ask the question to Councillor Finch. Thank you, Mr Robertson. What I will say is that this group is led by the MP Peter Aldous, and I'll pass on your request to him. Thank you very much. Um, is Michael Mandels Mandelsam Stam here? Um, I believe he has a question for Councillor Lisa Chambers. Welcome to the Chamber, Mr Mandelsam. Thank you. So um, my original question to Councillor Chambers was that on the 26th of June, Lisa Chambers confirmed in an email to me that Suffolk County Council has decided to withdraw the input of a specialist hospital teacher on the Rainbow Ward at West Suffolk Hospital for sick children. Such a teacher has been based daily on this ward for many, many years, providing teaching, support, motivation, diversion and liaison with schools. Those children staying under 15 days will now have no teacher input on that ward. Those staying 15 days or more will now have inconsistent input drawn from a pool of zero-hours teachers who will lack expertise in hospital-based teaching and lack familiarity with the ward, with the staff and how that ward works. That was the original question. Councillor Chambers, would you like to give your reply? Certainly, yes. Um, I think you also asked in your original question um, to ask when, um, with dates, and by whom the decision was made. So my answer will be around, uh, around that. The decision to alter the way we deliver the educational support to pupils who are short-term inpatients in the hospital was taken jointly between the acting head teacher at Kingsfield Prue, county manager, social inclusion, 
Ward Manager of the Rainbow Ward, County One-to-One -one Lead um, Teacher and the General Manager of the um, Women's and Children's Health Unit. The meeting was on the 12th of June at the West Suffolk Hospital and all were in agreement of the new way of working and it was felt that it would um, provide a single point of contact and consistency of support to the children, young people and their families. If there had been concerns expressed by any present, the action to alter the delivery of the service would not have been taken. In my recent letter of response to you regarding the matter, I have stated the reasons why we were not able to consult on a wider basis, and I have also informed you of the internal communication of the hospital staff and, um, that we had had also with the um, consultant paediatricians. It is important to be absolutely clear that we are not removing educational support from the children and young people who are inpatients in the at the hospital. Rather, that we are delivering teaching at the hospital in a different way. The teachers who will be allocated to these pupils as a single point of contact will have the experience in working with children and young people with medical conditions and will be able to bring a variety of skills and expertise to their role. As mentioned in my previous response, they will support the pupils at home, at the hospital, and if necessary, in their schools, therefore providing access to long-term and consistent educational input. Those pupils with less than 15 days absence will receive work and support from their school. This again will provide them with the consistency um, as they will continue to work with the, the staff who know them who know them well and who will be able to different, differentiate, oh, sorry, differentiate their work appropriately, taking into account the impact of their medical condition and their ability to access the curriculum. Mr Manderstam, do you have a supplementary question? Yes, I do. Um, thank you for that response. To put it shortly, uh, Suffolk's own education out of school policy says education should be delivered and designed in partnership with parents, children and other agencies, as in this case the NHS. In removing the teacher from the Rainbow Ward, that process has not been followed. Furthermore, and I'm sure this is due to inadequate briefing from senior officers, some of the information put out by Suffolk about You this, have a question. Yes, I do, has been partial and misleading. The constructive solution would be to hold a proper consultation and review with clinicians, with parents and children, and with Suffolk's own teacher. The question is really simple. Why will Lisa Chambers not order such a review and consultation? It's the obvious thing to do. Is she afraid of hearing things which will be at variance with what senior officers have told her? That's the question. Thank you very much, Councillor Chambers. I think that was two questions, but... Um. Okay, well, I, I can answer it. Yeah, that's, that's fine. I don't, I don't mind there being two questions. Um, I think I was very clear in my first response about the consultation that has happened and how that was carried out. And I think you're talking about a very unique cohort of individuals here. The majority of um, young people who attend West Suffolk Hospital, as I understand it, are very short-stay um, inpatients. Um, and to consult with um, that, that population on a wide scale um, would be difficult, um, considering um, patient confidentiality. But we have consulted, as I've expressed already, um, with, with the professionals in the field at the hospital, and everybody was in agreement of the new way of um, working. I'm also aware that you've asked a question at Sudbury Town Council meeting um, this week, I believe. Uh, not myself. Uh, okay. Um, and my suggestion to you today was to be that actually I think it would probably be a really good idea if, um, if we could arrange to meet and if we could actually talk through the issues that you have and the concerns that you have. Because as far as I'm concerned, we've carried out a very transparent process here. And um, at the heart of this for me, and the most important thing for me, is to ensure that we have a consistent, um, a consistent process for young people that supports them at a time when um, they are going through um, hospital care and that we can support them, that their education does not suffer in any way. So um, I have been satisfied with the, um, the process that has been followed, but I'm more than happy to meet with you and talk over your concerns about the consultation process. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Manister. Uh, next, we have uh, Mr. Roger Young, who has a question, I believe, for James Finch. Mr. Young, welcome to uh, Suffolk County Council. Please put your question. Right, uh, Councillor Finch. At the Suffolk Constabulary Safer Neighbourhood Team meeting held in March in Hadley, where over 70 residents attended, the safety of pedestrians in Benton Street was raised. Now, in response, the Besant chairman organised a meeting with the Suffolk County Council area manager or assistant area manager. Um, and at that meeting, which was held in May, he agreed to respond to the concerns raised and to the, and to the suggestions from residents for improvements. Can the portfolio holder confirm the process from here to making the required changes to the road layout with the expected dates. Councillor Finch. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr Young, for your question. Um, I'm very aware of the problems in Benton Street and the traffic passing through Benton Street. In fact, I've been involved with Benton Street since I first started work in 1971, so I'm aware of that. Now, I understand the prime concern is vehicles mounting the pavement and travelling along the pavement very close to doors of the houses in that street. The pavement is too narrow onto which to install bollards and still retain access for wheelchairs or prams, children's prams or buggies. Now, officers have been considering an experimental scheme to widen the pavement and then narrow the road so that measures can be provided to reduce the risk associated with vehicles driving on the pavement. And in fact, the prime responsibility of this council is all about safety. Now, in order to do this, it would be necessary to remove some parking spaces I shall be visiting this area again shortly because I have an appointment to come and look at it myself, bearing in my mind I'm, I'm new to this role, um, to better acquaint myself with the issues as they are today and the possible alternative solutions prior to reviewing how we take the project forward. Um, if I can say, I know Mr. Mary has drafted a letter and that will be coming out very shortly because I've seen it this last two weeks. Now, in terms of your request to expected dates, this will depend entirely on the adopted solution um, that will take place and we'll need to take into account a number of processes which include legal processes, democratic processes, the level of support and or objection because I understand not everybody is agreeable to every solution, um, the allocation of funding and whether there are any other construction works on the highway in the area. So it's quite a complex issue. Well, thank Young. you, Councillor Finch. Um, thank you for your response. It shows remarkable similarities uh, to previous replies from other councillors dating from 2008. And I guess it was probably drafted for you by the officers. Um, it's amazing what uh, cut and paste can do nowadays. <laughs> anyway, I, this is no joke. The residents of Hadley are very concerned about the lack of response. Um, and therefore, my supplementary question, Chairman, is when will the management of the Suffolk Highways Department demonstrate professional management skills in responding to the safety concerns of Hadley residents and if they are professionally qualified, I stress if they are, when will they uphold the ethical values and performance criteria of their own professional institutes? Um, I don't think that that's a question that uh, I believe uh, Councillor Finch should answer. Well, um, could the Chief Executive do so then? Uh, no, you put a question to, uh, to the uh, Council Finch. But well, I, I thought it was within his uh, policy. But you uh, are asking a, 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 a standards question, so I think we'll, we'll leave it at that and move on to the next question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman.
next question is from Sue Monks um, of Sud- Do we have Madam Chairman. Sue-, Sue Monks? Thank you very much. Councillor Finch. Can I just say a short word in response to that, that comment? Not about standards, but about what was accused of me. Mr Young, thank you for that supplementary question. I am taking Benton Street extremely seriously. I've already made an appointment to come and look at it, and I've already spoken to my officers to see what we can do about that exercise. Thank you, Councillor Finch. Could you explain why we have to wait wait four months? That's enough. Thank you very much. Representatives have to to wait as much as ten weeks for a reply. Mr Youngs, please. Miss, Miss Monk, would you like to carry on? Thank you. we give the next questioner um, her due respect? Thank you. Thank you. Can the Council please provide an update on the discussions held in late 2014 in relation to the need for increased school places in areas where housing development has already increased and is anticipating an increase? Bearing in mind the recognised shortfall in capital funding received by the Council and the awareness of the need to negotiate SIL obligations with developers, which in turn could result in reduced growth in our county, what plans have the Council in place for the additional funding required to provide adequate schooling for the county's children, in particular Hadley, where we have a high school currently turning children away from the feeder schools as it is oversubscribed? Councillor Chambers. Thank you, Madam Chairman. The Education and Learning Infrastructure Plan was presented to Cabinet in December 2014 and sets out our strategic approach to school place planning. We are committed to working with schools, academy sponsors and our partners at the District and Borough Councils to ensure that we have enough school capacity to meet the need for places across Suffolk and so fulfil our key statutory duty of providing a school place for each child. (coughs) We are closely monitoring the situation in Hadley, as in other places. The catchment population for the high school has always been quite erratic, and with a tendency to spike for one year or two before dropping once again. This year we are seeing similar numbers to um, what we we would have done around 2011, although it is expected to fall again in 2017. Hadley High School is an academy and and therefore has its own admissions policy. As such, the school has chosen to put siblings as as their highest ranking above looked-after children. In the years where catchment area population has been lower, places may may have been offered to to more out-of-catchment pupils. This can have a knock-on effect for, for those years which have a high level of catchment pupils. As this, means, as, as this means, a sibling of an out-of-catchment pupil is now attending the school. Who, uh, who was offered, this is quite complicated, I do apologise, who was offered a place um, as where, where there are places available at the time um, and will, ne- will now have a priority over the catchment applicant. Hadley High School is a popular school and attracts children from from nearby catchment areas. The school could look um, in the future at changing its criteria to to all catchment areas um, above the out-of-catchment siblings. But as an academy, this is a decision for them to consider and to consult upon. However, should the proposed housing developments in the area come to fruition it may be that there is a need to increase the places available at both primary and secondary provision in the town. And this is an issue raised in the Education and Learning Infrastructure Plan. To date, however, none of these proposed developments have been approved, so there is no certainty that this will happen, this will happen or when it is likely to happen. Undoubtedly, um, funding is a concern, We have lobbied long and hard for additional funding from the DfE and we believe their funding to date has not reflected the real level of need in Suffolk. We we expect future years' allocation to be slightly better, but we need to combine this with the developer contributions and, where necessary, borrowing against growth in council tax receipts to fund our programme. 
We, we must, however, ensure that our resources are targeted to those areas of greatest need and we will be able to um, provide additional places in all schools that, um, that would like them. But to focus on the areas where um, we have the greatest shortage. Thank you for that. Do you have a supplementary question? Yes, yes I do, Madam Chairman. Um, given, that Hadley, given that the school is already turning away children, do you think that Hadley is one of the areas of greatest need? And if the additional housing comes on stream, what would be the time scale to create further schools? Thank you for your question. Thank you. Councillor Chambers. Um, actually, Hadley is not one of our areas of um, highest concern at the moment. In the capital plan we have um, for this year, we have identified the new high school in Bury St Edmunds. We have new primaries in Ipswich, Red Lodge and Lake and Heath. These are all areas that are experiencing um, development now and are in desperate need for places now. Um, the schools are um, absolutely to capacity and um, we need to ensure that there are not just additional classrooms there but actually physically new primary school buildings. So we do track this very closely right across Suffolk and the education infrastructure plan is there to, as a guidance aid for us um, to consult with our districts and boroughs to ensure that we don't find ourselves where children do not have um, school places available for them. So I really want to, in my response to you, give you assurance, give assurance to you that um, we do monitor this uh, with our very public-facing education and learning infrastructure plan and all the data that the officers have behind the scenes to ensure that it is monitored and tracked very, very closely year on year. Thank you very much. Uh, that concludes the public questions. We will now move on to agenda item six. Um, in accordance with rule 3.1 of the Constitution, one motion has been received. The wording of the motion is on page three of your agenda. This is an important issue for debate. I would remind councillors to refrain from repetition and faffing around, as I, as I suggested in my uh, original speech way back in May. Um, I will sound the bell 30 seconds before your allotted time, and I will look to you to wind up. I won't interrupt you unless it looks as if you're headed up for Christmas. Okay. Um, uh, Motion number one, proposed by Councillor Sarah Adams and seconded by, I believe now, Councillor, uh, by, uh, Hel Councillor Helen Armitage. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, uh, Councillor Story. I'd like to propose two slight amendments to the motion, if I may. Um, can I explain what they are? Yeah. Um, in the first sentence, this council believes that sending children and young people with mental health problems to out-of-county placements may damage their recovery. So rather than it, the county council is damaging their recovery, may damage their recovery. And then in the final sentence, this council calls upon the administration to use all necessary influence and resources to ensure that we develop appropriate Tier 4 provision in Suffolk and continues as is. Uh, do we all agree to the uh, revised amendments? Yes, thank you. I need a second. You need a second there? <coughs> Madam Chairman, I would willingly second that motion. Thank you very much. That now becomes the substantive motion. Thank you, Councillor uh, Adams. Thank you very much. Um, I think we're all aware of the, um, the need for good and excellent children and adult mental health services, uh, not just in Suffolk, but across the UK and across the world. But they, as we know from health scrutiny last week, there are a lot of words about co-production, working together and all the rest of it across all the different providers. But frequently this doesn't happen. We have a number of cases of children and young people being let down by the system where they're passed from pillar to post by different professionals because funding for slightly different things is always in slightly different place. And making this joined up is hugely, hugely important. What we want the council to do is put huge pressure on the NHS and the CCG to deliver because at the moment that is where the major funding lies. Yes, the county has some responsibility in terms of social workers, some responsibility in terms of schools, but putting even more responsibility on schools I think would be even more damaging to a number of those young people. 
I think we're all aware of the increase at all ages of uh, mental health issues. I think it goes from basically from sperm to worm, if you like. It's from before children are born to the end of people's lives. It is a lengthy process, and unless we get it right at every stage of the process, we are going to have people, more and more people going into Tier 4 provision. That is of concern to myself and I know a number of other county councillors because the Tier 4 provision in Suffolk I don't think is adequate at the moment. I know that there are moves to put more um, emphasis onto schools delivering mental health, but frequently teachers are not professional in delivering or diagnosing me mental health issues and the schools don't have the capacity to deliver it. Children, closing some of the children's centres means that a number of those young people who may well have been seen when their mothers were pregnant, when they were in um, early years, and then go into primary, is not happening. Um, looking at specialist support centres, I'm a chair of governors of two schools who have specialist support uh, units, one for 10 pupils, one for 20. There was a proposal to close that. There was a huge outcry by parents, and there is a review, review going on. One of the senior officers involved with that says not only should we not be closing, but we should be increasing capacity and actually putting SSC, Specialist Support Centre provision, into high schools. The number of young people self-harming now is on the increase, not just in Suffolk but across the UK. Social media does play some role in that, but we need to be sure that for the people of Suffolk and for the young people of Suffolk, we are not sending them out of county, we are not sending young people to adult provision, which is inappropriate for their needs, and that we are actually fulfilling what we should be doing as a county council in scrutinising all the different bodies providing mental health capacity and making sure that we increase and support it and that we're not letting people get to tier four when they're having to be sectioned and taken into care because we the system can't cope with it. We have another problem in, with the academy chains in that they don't have a legal obligation to be dealing with the mental health in the same way and if the county council isn't doing it in the state schools who also don't have in terms of, pub, um, in terms of PSHE, sexual health and education. What's the first bit? Physical, physical, sexual health and education. Um, if, if it's not being done in there, then a lot of young people are being failed again. Uh, a number of the academy change will not be taking this on board. Some of the better ones will because they will realise it's better for the overall well-being of the young people. The beds at Carlton Court, the five beds there, which is inadequate for county anyway, have not yet got their funding, which is hugely important. And again, county can put pressure on the NHS to make sure this happens. I do hope that you'll all be able to support this motion. I think it is hugely important that we all work together. And I think, frankly, in the NHS, in mental health, which, as a number of politicians said at the general election, mental health should have parity with all other health issues. It's certainly not the case at the moment. I would urge you all to work to make this a reality for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Adams. Uh, Councillor Goldson, as you are now the new seconder, would you like to speak now or reserve your right? I'll speak now, if I may, Madam Chairman. Thank you, um, Councillor Adams. NHS England commissions all the Tier 4 mental health and learning disability health care provision for children and young people within a number, with, a, with a number of providers across the east of England. However, Due to the specialised nature of these prescribed services, these are not always located locally. NHS England is aware that some children and young people are admitted to services which are further away from home and this can be very distressing and difficult for both the young person and their family. The decision to place children and young people in specialised services that are some distance from their home is always considered in relation to each individual's care and treatment needs. Children and young people are kept as close to home as possible. However, at times the decision to place some distance away from home is clinically appropriate and in the young person's best interest, sometimes making travel a necessary outcome of the treatment pathway. As part of the National CAMS Tier 4 review published last year, the need for additional beds in this region was identified and these are now operational. This recognised the need to increase inpatient capacity for children and young people with specialised mental health needs within the east of England. Currently, a national pre-procurement project is underway to determine if CAMS Tier 4 services will be subject to national procurement in the future. A national meeting has taken place later this month where the findings of this project will be put forward. NHS England is working together with local commissioning colleagues and other relevant stakeholders 
to consider how children and young people are supported at different stages in their pathway with the drive towards strengthening community provision. Thank you, Councillor Goldson. Could you? Thank you. Uh, okay.